Fantastic. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Pierce, Jeff, Ignacio, and everybody else over at PSFK and behind the scenes over there putting this together. This gathering is exceptional. And I want to thank you guys for the work that you do, not only today, but every day to deliver some exceptional insights uh, to us. Uh, just as important, uh, I want to thank uh, all you curious minds out there who have decided to drop in for this conversation today. It's pretty amazing to have such a large group of people, as I know there's so many things that are are vying for our attention uh, and time now more than ever. Uh, as Pierce mentioned, over the last three days, we have dove into a number of themes and heard from some exceptionally talented and given the topic of retail, uh, resilient people. Uh, keeping the foot on the gas, uh, we're going to uh, be speaking with Julie today. And as a refresher, the Yes is a, a new e-commerce platform that leverages AI and some really sophisticated and, and heady algorithms to deliver us as shoppers uh, a truly personalized and adaptive uh, experience. You know, chatting with Julie recently, you know, we were talking about uh, you know, the, the yes arriving at just the right time, especially if we're to consider the current crisis as an extinction event for legacy retail. So I suppose if we follow on that line, and if it is an extinction event, uh, and therefore the old retail gods have died, I guess we'll have to ask, is the yes where we find salvation? And I think we'll unpack that a little bit today. Uh, so we've got about 20 minutes and so many interesting avenues to explore. Um, we're going to uh, sort of window shop around five themes. Um, some of those include innovation, uh, business models, and paths to profitability and the customer uh, experience and decision journey. Um, in closing, before we just jump in, I, I wanted to say once again, I was fortunate to spend time speaking with Julia a few weeks uh, back and found her to be inspiring, easygoing, very familiar. I felt like you know, I've, I've known her for, for eons and I hope everybody will feel the same after our chat. So um, with that, Julie, um, to kick things off, uh, I've been trying to think of just say a precise and encapsulating question to ask you about what we've all been sort of witnessing and experiencing since March. And unfortunately, all the questions I was coming up with felt a little forced or contrived. So maybe it's better given your vast sort of seen it all experience and exhaustive list of accomplishments with Nordstrom and Urban Outfitters and Sephora, just to simply ask, what have you been observing and thinking about I guess, personally and professionally amid everything going on in the world? Uh, that's a big question. <laughs> With some uh, conciseness. You know, I think what's interesting about what's happened as a result of COVID is that companies needed to, like traditional retailers needed to change the way that they were running their businesses probably faster than they were because the pressures of kind of maintaining the status quo um, whether it's public market or private investors is is heavy. And mm -hmm. to some degree, this um, period has been a forcing function to make changes that were needed to be made. They probably needed to be made five years ago, but they certainly need to be made now for the future. Um, and you know, there are the way that traditional retail has been set up, the pressure on the profitability of the four walls of a store, um, don't make sense. You know, traffic continues to shrink year after year. And so a new way of thinking about the blend of your online and offline business needs to emerge. Um, focus on innovation and digital need to be serious. And I think it's a combination of um, sort of right-sizing a company's organization, restructuring a company's organization, and, um, you know, being able to make some tough choices in this case, by forcing sort of these decisions. And so ultimately, I think it will help retail get into a healthier place and less of a like slow, painful decline um, that they've been experiencing over, um, you know, the last really 10 years. Um, so I think it's going to be interesting. I don't believe that physical retail is ever going away. I think it's a human pastime, you know, has mm -hmm. been since the beginning of mankind with markets. Um, I personally, you know, my favorite activity is shopping. It will certainly take an enormous hit until there is a vaccine and people feel safe. Um, and so, you know, there will be an end at some point to COVID and there will be, you know, a very small, uh, slight return until, you know, people feel safe. And then 
I do think it will reduce the number of um, sort of physical stores and footprint um, and will increase sort of everyone's ability to operate a great online business. So, um, you know, in essence, I feel like this will speed up the inevitable and, yep. you know, the, the making room for new ideas like ours is something we plan, you know, we started this business two years ago. It just took us two years to build uh, sort of the infrastructure that we needed to run this business. I do think we have a little bit of an advantage in that people are more open to trying new things right now because they're stuck at home um, sure. and they're doing everything digitally. But I believe the opportunity existed before and continues to exist now um, for disruption. Well, it's kind of interesting. I mean, talking about disruption and innovation, um, there were some folks within the industry um, that I was speaking with recently, whose names I'll just sort of park to the side, but uh, they've been watching what's going on and waiting it, waiting for it to be quote unquote over. So they, so they and their businesses can sort of return to a normal retail life. And I guess, you know, the question is, is a return, and I think it's a rhetorical, is a return to normal even a possibility when we're already seeing an alarming number of fashion-related businesses fall during this pandemic? I mean, we look at J. Crew, we look at Neiman Marcus, Barbados, and even outside of that category, you see the likes of Microsoft last week announcing that they're exiting physical retail altogether. So, you know, just curious you know, if you could sort of unpack what you sort of uh, just sort of touched on earlier. What do you think this new normal is going to look like? And, you know, certainly uh, use the yes as an example. And then, you know, from the business standpoint, I'm just curious what you think the psychological toll this will all have on consumers and how their expectations are going to change based on some new habits and conditioning that's happening right now. I think the failures come from businesses that were already struggling. So it just sort of kind of gets us to the end point faster. Um, I do think healthy businesses will, with compelling brands and compelling value propositions, will figure out how to retool and shift their resources and investments appropriately. You know, stores really ultimately are going to be like what catalogs became for, you know, online businesses, which is a place to look and get ideas, um, but it's not going to be the primary selling channel over time. I mean, it was already, you know, I think ultimately it will shift to at a minimum 50-50, um, which requires a very different sort of economic model to make a store work in that case. Um, and so you need to look at sort of your business in, in total um, and right size it. I do think that um, there is, you know, the truth is that shopping has stayed kind of the same for the last 20 years. So we e-commerce emerged and we basically put the store online. It was a large catalog and it's kind of up to the consumer to figure out how to navigate through it and find what they want. And the big insight for the yes, and I think we will see this, we've seen this in media already and we'll see it, I think, more in the future. I actually think our model will become more of the future model is um, that there, you know, there needs to be a layer that helps the consumer find what it is that's relevant for them and what they're looking for. So yeah. in a world of, you know, massive amounts of um, options, you need sort of the ability to say, find me the things that are relevant for me, or if I'm looking for something specific, make it easy and surface the relevant things for me. And so that's what the yes really does is it's taking sort of the world of tons of assortment, um, we're specifically a women's fashion shopping app um, on iOS right now, but we really see, saw the problem as it's an overwhelming amount of choice. The more brands there are, the more DTC opportunities, the more sites that emerge, the more overwhelmed the shopping experience is and the user is. And so how do we create a solution for this where brands can thrive? We are very, we're really a tech platform that's in support of brands specifically. And um, you can match users to brands. And so um, as a user, you are, um, sort of surface the relevant things for you. You can find what you want and it's a store really built around you. Um, and for a brand, you have the chance to find new consumers and learn a lot about the consumer. We're sharing all the data that we can. So, you know, there are certain things that um, in the older model of retail, a store owned inventory and it was, you were as a shopper limited to whatever inventory was owned by that store. Um, the onus is on you to find sort of the right things for you. Um, and the idea that, um, you know, uh, sort of a 
person would come and shop in your store, you own them and you own the data. And I mm -hmm. think all three of those things have sort of are no, no longer make sense in this world. So there's no reason for multiple people to own the inventory, let the brand own the inventory. And um, it doesn't need to be shipped in extra location to ship to the consumer. Um, and you know, it's much more economical for the brand to hold the inventory in one place. Um, there's no reason to keep the data from the brands. We want them to thrive. You know, a retailer can't thrive unless the brands within its ecosystem thrive. And so, you know, I really think that a lot of the things that were assumed as business model requirements in traditional retail need to be rethought. And so, um, you know, that's what our um, business model is doing. So we have sort of the consumer value prop, which is take everything out there, synthesize it for me and make it fun and interesting and engaging and learn from me. So as I shop, I can tell you what I like and what I don't like, and it gets smarter. So you feel like your shopping time is not wasted. It's time well spent. So whether you're buying or you're saving for later, which we're seeing a lot of people doing, um, you're actually improving the experience for yourself next time. Um, but from a business model standpoint, there's no need to reshoot every photo that a brand has already shot beautifully on their own model. There's no need to move the inventory, take a guess what consumers will want and move it into our warehouse. Let's just ship it direct from the brand. And there's no reason to kind of hold tightly to that customer. We are happy to share all the data that can be useful to the brand so that they can continue to learn and grow and thrive as a brand. It's kind of, <clears throat> there are so many um, launch points from what you've just said, but I do want to go back to um, the earlier piece because I think you just touched on it. Talking about the business model and the path to profitability. You know, I read a, a, a research report from Bain uh, not too long ago, and you know, they were talking about while online luxury sales grew by double digits in 2019, multi-brand e-commerce platforms like Ukes, Netta, and luxury good conglomerates like Caring have struggled to make e-commerce profitable. And I guess the question that I was had for you, which I think you you touched on, and maybe we can dive into that a little bit more, but what do you think was missing? Do you think, as you sort of alluded to, that there were supply chain and operational uh, inefficiencies in terms of shipping to a location, as one example, shipping from one location to receive it, to inventory it, to warehouse it, and then to pick and pack and ship to another location? There were just so many touches and so many inefficiencies along the way. So I'm just, just curious why, uh, you know, you've got a lot of smart people with a lot of, uh, associated with a lot of huge multinationals with billion dollar valuations, but yet as it comes to their e-commerce operations, they're just struggling for profitability. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's, there's always many reasons. I mean, I love to get into an organization and understand their PL because it's so interesting to see kind of where the costs are and how different organizations run in theory, similar businesses. Um, you know, I think it's really understanding uh, what, what the cost drivers are and how you make them more efficient. So certainly inventory is a huge piece of it. Um, things like understanding how you can reduce return rate has an enormous value. Um, you know, there's so much expense in shipping things back and forward. One of the things we're really focused on at the yes is reducing return rate by being able to do a number of things. One is understand people's likelihood to return so that you can recommend things that are, they're less likely to return and also really understanding size and fit. Um, which we're very focused on so that we can help people only have to, you know, we, we actually select the size for the user. So everything is um, sort of defaulted to the size that based on the information you give us, um, we believe in this brand is right for you. So I think there are, what are the key cost drivers and understanding those businesses? Certainly holding the inventory is very expensive, especially for luxury brands. Mm -hmm. um, and so sort of the efficiency in that is important. Um, technology is really expensive. And if you don't make the right choices, you can end up overspending in a way that doesn't pay you back. And so that's another key element is really having sort of leveraging technology in the way that it can optimize um, your business, um, but not spending and overspending in complex systems that basically at the end of the day aren't driving customer, you know, sort of ROI and customer value. Um, one of the big th areas of focus for me at Sephora was there were so many systems questions and decisions. And I was always focused on, I'm only interested in doing sort of the investing in the technology that I can understand the clear return on um, right away. Because at the end of the day, 
you can go down, you know, a path, which I know uh, Uxana Porte has had a lot of structural uh, issues with their sort of tech infrastructure. And sure. those things can be very costly. Well, it's interesting. You're talking about um, reducing the return rate is just sort of one example. Um, and that really comes back down to what you guys are doing from a customer experience standpoint. Um, I think we all know that tech companies like Spotify and Netflix and Uber have long since streamlined the customer decision journey, yet it could be said that the fashion industry, um, just sort of broadly speaking, both brands and retailers have had some problems uh, following along. Um, I think, you know, when I look at the yes, uh, the, the technology is certainly a, a, a point of differentiation. And so I'm just curious if you could just dive in a little bit more around that tech um, and how you are approaching that problem. And, and I think using your words to me a couple of weeks ago, helping people to easily find what they love, because some of the things you shared with me in terms of the 500 data points that you're capturing around a customer, it's just, it's just mind blowing. Absolutely mind blowing. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, the truth is that, you know, my the intersection of data technology and fashion is my true love. And so to be able to use technology to make the shopping experience better is something that I've spent my whole career on. Um, and, you know, with AI moving from kind of a, a more um, sort of a theoretical model to now something that can be very practically applied. It's been super fun and interesting. My belief is that, and we see it in the music and entertainment businesses, you need to understand the category you're focused on super deeply to be able to make a recommendation engine that's legitimate. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to do in fashion. So we spent a year and a half building the most extensive taxonomy that exists in fashion so that we could really understand every dimension. And then we did an enormous amount of testing to understand which data points actually help uh, sort of recommend the right suggestions. And there's so many factors in fashion, it's so nuanced. There's the hard facts. So there's things like, this is the color, this is the fit, this is the fabric. And then there's, you know, this is the price point. Those things are all really important. Um, and then there's also just, this is the style. And the style is something that's very hard to understand and capture. And no one is one style. So there's no, you know, it's amazing. Like we, no one's home feed is the same because every person's combination of interests is really different. And so you can't possibly figure that out as a human. And that is where like, to me, even if you're shopping with your best friend and you think you know her style, you're gonna sort of say, do you like this? And I've experimented with so many times, maybe one out of three times, she'll be like, yeah, that I really like. But you know, I think it's, it's actually almost impossible for humans to sort of figure out what you're gonna like. And so I think the pickier you are, the harder it is to actually meet your needs. Um, and so we have this combination of sort of human input up front where we know all the dimensions that matter. Then we let kind of the AI run, we learn from the user. So all this feedback we're getting through the user saying yes and no to the product gives us great information. And over time, our algorithm really understands and can predict the things you're going to like and not. And it's constantly, because fashion is changing, putting new things out in front of you. Um, but it really takes understanding deeply kind of the category and the user base um, so that you can understand what kinds of things matter to women when they're shopping. Um, sure. You know, it's not a purely um, data problem. It's really a problem of understanding sort of human psychology as well as understanding um, fashion. And then there's other things that are, you know, kind of layers on top of it. So if you think about Spotify, what the sort of, and, and Pandora actually, um, who built the music genome, they were, they had music experts understanding all the dimensions of music that are important identifiers. And then there's sort of the benefit of sort of this huge audience over time to sort of share this um, sort of understanding of what interests sort of map to people. We are starting with just a sort of cold set of data where you as a user are telling us about yourself, we're making recommendations. And then over time, we'll obviously have all sources of all sorts of additional sources of data. Um, yeah. But I don't think you could do what we're doing if you were trying to do it again across multiple categories. So, right. you know, while Google and Facebook and Pinterest are trying to do lots of interesting things using computer vision to make recommendations, you know, I was very clear that you can't do fashion and beauty and even women's and men's at the same time. Mm. 
You have to really understand sort of one category first, and then you sort of dimensionalize from that. So we even started with apparel. We're still working on accessories. Um, and these things are, they take a level of attention and detail um, that sort of really understands the category to be able to make it useful. It also requires a great user interface. So the experience itself has to be intuitive and it has to invite customer feedback sort of very organically. Um, and so that combination is, I think, what makes the yes unique. Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't agree with you more. I was having a conversation with a, with a friend of mine last night and we were talking about um, machine learning and these large data structures. What unusual company um, it is to pair it with something that's dynamic and trend driven like fashion. Yeah. Um, and it really requires, I would imagine, um, a combination of this art and science. Uh, they couldn't... Uh, uh, they couldn't be separated from one another. Um, I'm getting a little note now. It's 11.55. That went quick. Um, I do have one more sort of question for you. It's sort of bringing it a little bit full circle. Um, how do you and your team um, stay hungry and motivated? What I mean by that, you've, you've been at this a while, watched as well as contributed to a few waves of innovation and disruption within this industry, and not least of which we're all living at this point in time in a remote scenario in complete isolation. So I'm just curious, what are some of your external or internal uh, motivators? Such a good question. I mean, I would say first and foremost, life is not as fun right now as it was before. You know, the team not being together and sort of experiencing the world through behind from behind a screen um, as opposed to living it. And so I just think that sort of universal is nothing's quite as fun. And I can't wait until the world opens up again or the country opens up again, I should say. Um, I would say that we, we are very customer feedback focused. And so we actually spend time every day um, getting feedback from users. And I, I just love, I love the idea of using technology and solving problems. And so I think the whole team is a very problem solving oriented team. And what drew people to working on this is this is a, a meaty challenging uh, problem to solve. And you need sort of lots of feedback to keep going. I think that's the reality for all of us. And so we get feedback from customers, we get feedback from each other and everyone is, you know, I think we feel very much like a team in this together, um, learning and growing and making progress. And that feeling of actually, whether it's like a brand will reach out and say, thank you so much. This is so cool. I loved, you know, this post that you did, or a customer will say, I have been waiting for this and I didn't even know it, you know, that kind of feedback, or this is how, you know, some will people will say it didn't quite get me. This is what it didn't get. And we learn from all of those. And so I think the idea of like continuing this feeling of progress yeah. Um, in growing and changing and improving keeps me and the team motivated. Well, speaking of progress, I can't wait for, uh, for you to introduce men's because I know <laughs> my wife has been absolutely digging the yes. And I know, by the way, we are coming up on time. So as I said to the folks in the green room, you're the type of person that could spend two hours with and, and feel like I could go for another two hours. So I want to thank you for your time. Um, and on behalf of everyone as well, I want to wish you and the rest of the team at the Yes continued success. And to everybody else that's sort of tuning in right now, stay safe and enjoy the long holiday weekend. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for the great question. Of course, of course.